Welcome to Office Hours 33 of China X. It's now been a full year almost since we began the course, and we're happy to have you with us and happy to have you just start with us. But we want to warn you that pretty soon we'll be coming to an end, perhaps early in the spring. Uh, the next email will talk about certificates, honor certificates, verified certificates, so I won't bring that up, up here. You all have met, I think most of you have met, Adam Mitchell before. Adam began as a student with us, working with us in China as well. And he's now a graduate student here at Harvard. And we're going to, as Bill is away in Asia, we're going to be try doing this office hours together. Adam, did you know what the connection to Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado was? I think it has something to do with Orientalism, the conception of China and Japan from the West. OK. Well, I think we better send that question to Bill when he gets back. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. There were some, some other questions. Somebody asked about Chiang Kai-shek's or Zhang Jiexi's move north, the nationalist move north in 1927. Was there one big deciding battle for that? Well, it was a gradual process with several major battles. So in 1925, uh, Sun Yat-sen dies. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek claims power, claims that he is the rightful successor. In 1926, he launches the Northern Exhibition, mm -hmm. and this makes the first united front with the communists, with uh -huh. the Soviet Russians and the Chinese Communist Party. And they start in Guangdong, and then they push north, and hence it's called the Northern Expedition. Right. Uh, and eventually, partway through the Northern Expedition, uh, the nationalist Chiang Kai-shek decides to turn on the communist allies. In Shanghai, they have a massacre trains block off the city and machine guns mow down uh, groups of uh, communist supporters. And uh, that kind of launches the civil war. Um, and, and then the civil war ensues. So the process of recapturing all of the territory of the former Qing Empire is a gradual one, with many battles fought between many different okay. people. Uh, somebody asked, how did Yuan Shikai die? So he died of uremia. So he had kidney failure. Uh, OK. There are some issues here also about how uh, Zhang Jiexi, Chiang Kai-shek, built his military uh, conscription or voluntary combination of both, as far as we know. Now, there's some other questions. What books are best to read? More on social life and customs. For that, you're going to have to wait for China X2, the second iteration of China X. The discussion was based on a short clip from a film compiled by the United States government's Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, based on news reports from other organizations to show what China was like around the time of the Great Leap Forward 5961. In that sense, it was out of place. Um, we, uh, we used it because it, it fit a particular theme that Professor Kirby was talking about, and that theme was the militarization, militarization of the soul. Right. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there was, I think, one of the things we asked was, look through the footage taken in China during the Great Leap Forward years, 59, 61. What do you conclude from the video about the state of China at this point in its history? What forms of social organization do you notice? What evidence do you see for a new society of communist China? Um, since we were really talking about the earlier period, it sort of didn't fit entirely. but. Be that as it may, what do we learn? XJ Wang, what does he have to say? He says that they are organized, well-disciplined people. This seems to be a theme that runs through, right? People keep noticing a sense of organization and, and discipline. Right, right. right. In this, right? Uh, he said that the biggest difference of communist China is that it was a well-organized state and the society was ordered as a right. whole. And in fact, one of the things that, that people mention frequently here is that the skies above Beijing were blue. Right, which or is perhaps not the same case today. Not today, <laughs> not today. Bain USA Net says, in fact, we're seeing a city, but as a city, it's underdeveloped. It's much more like a 1930s city. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's probably much more like a 1910s city, to tell you the truth, right. that at this point. But uh, certainly, it's totally different from China today. A lot of order in this place, though. Dosher comments, and I think this is a fair comment, you know, we're only seeing this urban area and we don't really get a sense of the rest of China and Chinese society, so it's hard to really answer the question about society. 
he makes a point, and this is also reflected by a number of our other viewers, but that there seems to be a heightened equality between men and women. Interesting. That you see yeah. their participation of men and women in marches, mm -hmm. that you see them carrying around guns and things like that, mm -hmm. um, also related to this process right. of militarization. But right. active participation of both genders in this new society. Right, right. Yeah, lots of people together on the streets, organized, working hard, mm -hmm. and so on. EM11 cites Professor Kirby's phrase, the militarization of the soul, right? He talks about the presence of guns as if they're a normal quotidian part of everyday life. He talks about big character posters being plastered on the walls and along the streets, that people are standing in front of these posters and reading them, that people are actively engaged mm -hmm. in this process uh, of propaganda. The news is, yeah. Well, I don't know if it's a he or a she, but EM11 mm -hmm. actually makes some good points. J.B. White talks about these the clear blue skies of Beijing, pre-World War II technology in many ways. But he makes another thing, is that the social organizations that exist seem communal right? and not concerned with consumer culture. Some people might say it's drab, but I think a nicer way is saying they're not caught up in consumer culture. Right. How about o Osco Pack? So Osco Pack makes an interesting point. He says, the parade, there's a parade of young people with an old gentleman among them. It did not appear to be automatons being pressed into service mm. by the state. And this is an interesting point. Many of our other uh, commenters said that it appeared as if everybody was under the control of the state, that they had no individuality, that they were not making decisions on their own. But he says, no, in fact, it looks like a very real depiction of everyday life, yeah. and people are just going about yeah. how they would live. Yeah. Although he, he does talk about regimentation as a sort of a theme running through mm -hmm. the videos and wall posters, uh, red flags, and so on. Gary Goldstein, uh, you know what he did? I, I don't know, I thought it was really interesting. He watched it without the audio. Right. He said without the audio, he saw a clean city with hazy blue skies. He saw order. He saw people in uniform. Uh, he saw cars and buses, but everything looked cleaned and organized. However, there was still the presence of former modes of transportation. There was a donkey. Mm -hmm. He said that everything was clean and orderly. Yeah. Eo Hock makes this something of the same point, that no disgruntled people here. Everyone seems happy. Um, but it's a vi urban urban video, and right. it's hard to it's hard to generalize from that. Nadalv says shows a society yearning for order, uh, people marching in rehearsal for National Day celebrations, calm and quiet on the streets, propaganda mm -hmm. banners, um, and still uh, a not unhappy society. Right? In, in, in place. And I think that's probably true, that the news organizations that were allowed to film in China this time were tightly controlled, and what they saw was tightly controlled. Imel, notice, optimism, people working hard, not too many cars, buses, and trucks. Mm -hmm. And I still remember this. In 1985, when I was first in, in Beijing, there were still no taxis. Right? All, we went around by bus, by truck, or by bicycle. And it was only 20 years before this that you would have mostly seen rickshaws being pulled on That's the streets. Right. That's right. No fat people. That is certainly something that uh, is different than maybe the con Beijing of today. Right. Uh, and lots of write, written notices that right. people are reading. Right. People are engaged right. with the production of and yeah. the reading of these character posters. Yeah. Total mobilization. F again, noticing few new buildings, right. which I think is probably right in there. Hansen HB sees a militarized society, right. um, paucity of modern technology, old cars, old trucks. And the last person, we have to have this last person, is, he gives his name as Harvard <laughs> Lee, um, which in Chinese would be Li Ha <laughs> um, So what does he see? A happy and harmonious society. He sees people in military uniform. Mm -hmm. He sees weapons, but they're arranged order in an orderly fashion. He sees maintained buildings and polite traffic. <laughs> he also points out one thing I think this is good to keep in mm -hmm. mind. Remember that the, the video you saw is from 5961, well ahead of where the course is at the moment. But he does make the point that we're not seeing the consequences right. of the Great Leap Forward. And you will hear more about those consequences. They weren't attractive. They were pretty terrible for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, I guess it's simple enough to say that rather than leaping forward, Chinese economy leapt backwards. Oh, certainly, everything. certainly. Well, thanks a lot for joining us for this Office Hours. Um, and we will see you, or Bill Kirby will be back next week, and we'll see you then. See Bye -bye. you soon.